everybody. We have about a third of the people who signed up already in here. I have a feeling that people will come and go and a lot of people signed up so that they could get the link and watch later and that's fine. Thank you all for joining us tonight. I'm going to start. Oh, we are recording. Very good. Okay. Oh, must be doing that automatically. Well, welcome. I wanted to do this special session in between the regular monthly mentoring webinars because so many times there are a lot of questions and I don't have the time to get to all of them because I've had so much teaching from my guides. And so tonight is going to be strictly question and answer. And I will do my best to get to as many questions as I can. I talked it over with Ty and with Bev thinking what's the best way to do this. And in the past when we do webinars, when we bring people on camera to ask their questions, there's a little bit of a challenge sometimes with getting people's cameras going, getting the microphone going, and that takes up our time. So we're just going to let Bev take your questions and read them to me. And uh, I don't know what the questions are in advance, but we'll just crank through them. And if something happens that we do want to bring somebody on screen, we'll ask your permission before we do that. You have a choice of view. You can uh, click at the top. Usually it's top right of your screen. You can click gallery view or speaker view, toggle back and forth to see which one you prefer. You can see other people or just them and me at once or just whoever's speaking. So uh, let's see. Yeah, usually I have lots of announcements and I have pages of notes, but I have absolutely uh, no notes other than a few reminders at the end of about events that are coming up, but let's all just get in the right space for this evening. I've been sitting here talking to my team and listening to amazing music that has me all pumped up and listening to Bev gets me all pumped up. So let's just come into a nice state of resonance with each other. Would you join me in just thinking of all of that you've been through today, everything you've been dealing with, let's inhale and as we exhale, just release all the tension and all the stress. I absolutely love doing that. And let's do a little invocation so we share our intention this evening. If you would just move your attention, your awareness to the heart, I'm doing the same. Imagine all of our hearts around the world connected energetically, which they are always, they cannot be separated. And in awareness of that connection, that state of no separation, that state of unconditioned love, feel that rise up within you. Turn that up within yourself. If it's feeling a little low, if you've been feeling a little sad or separated, know that you will feel buoyed tonight simply by the energy of all of us coming together. So may we support each other energetically this evening. May we each hear something that helps further our journeys together and helps to bring more light into our lives and into our world. We're so grateful for this time together and I thank my team for being present to help these answers come from the highest possible place. And so it is. So speaking of the answers, if a question has been asked before of my guides or of me and the answer is just really clear to me, I will just say it right away. But in most cases, no matter if I know it or not, I'm going to do my best to pause and make sure that the answer comes from that, that integrated space that I've gotten myself into already, knowing that my guides are present. I've been having quite the connection with them lately and haven't felt the need to go into a distinct channeling state. I'm able to tune into them just as is. So we will see how that goes this evening. So Bev, are you ready to uh, throw the questions at me? I am. All right, let me just state before you start, for everybody's sake, that I do not claim that these answers are absolute truth. My guides were talking to me as I was on a bike ride earlier today and saying that there is no absolute truth in this reality, this duality-based reality called Earth School, because of its very nature as a dual reality. Absolute truth would mean 
there is no opposite. And as they wanted all of us to understand, the only one truth is pure being and a state of no separation, and that is pure love. So anything that's going to come through me tonight is going to have a little bit of a slant. And so test everything in your heart. When I say slant, I want to go back to the disco ball analogy that I used in the last mentoring session, that the source arises within all of us and projects this awareness. Seven and a half human beings. This is on a disco ball and little slants in a slightly different direction. And we resonate when we are, we resonate with each other when our directions line up, they're aligned. We all resonate when we align with our true nature, which is love. But because of the infinite number of viewpoints that we as source can have, it will always be relative. So just so you know, I'm not claiming to be an expert on anything. I'm simply going to try to align with the highest truth. Sorry about that, Bev. <laughs> go, ahead, go ahead and uh, ask the first question. Okay, that leads perfectly into a first question here from Kathy. Um, both you and Esther, of, of Esther and Abraham, Esther Hicks, channeled collective consciousness, as did Edgar Casey and Jane Roberts with Seth and others like Silver Birch. Um, the root of your messages are the same but you relay them, the message in different ways. Is the divine coming through differently because of the different personalities or is it to resonate with a variety of souls? Wow, that is perfect. <laughs> and the answer is yes and yes. And this is exactly why the one mind differentiates itself into different aspects of consciousness. Uh, there is growth and learning to be had by having different viewpoints and so hopefully those viewpoints align and if somebody sees any similarity between this teaching from Sanaya and teaching from Abraham or Seth it's because then we are tapping into a uh, similar vibration of the source and again hopefully it resonates okay all right great um, Diane asks, um, mediums and psychics rarely talk about kundalini rising. It seems they don't have to go through it to access higher consciousness, but many people objectively go through kundalini rising on their spiritual path. Would Sanaya comment on what is the reason for that experience, its nature, and what one is to do afterward? Okay. And so please understand that even though my voice may not change, these answers are all coming from Tanaya and Suzanne together here. Kundalini is the, the energy of consciousness that lies. It starts at the base of the spine and rises up each of the chakras representing higher and higher aspects of our true nature. All of them together become our oneness. The lower three are the more earthly aspects of our existence here in human form, the heart being the bridge, and the upper three are direct connection with the spirit world. So many can live our entire lives without our consciousness rising in our awareness beyond the first three earthly ones. Now understand, of course, consciousness, the source is flowing through us or we wouldn't be breathing. But there, it, there is a rising of this energy, our own personal vibration, as that energy ascends through the chakras. Some of you may have experienced what I refer to as ramping ups in your energetic field, a period of several weeks when you can't sleep well, you are getting incredible insights you just seem more tuned in and and aligned with higher consciousness and then you get used to it and that levels off and that becomes your new normal this is a bit of kundalini rising but it's happening happening in stages that's been my experience we call these little breakthroughs 
where I am was speaking of is the Kundalini rising experiences where some people happen all at once. They actually feel the heat rising and it can be very disconcerting from what I have read. Let me make sure this isn't just coming from what Suzanne has read. We're supposed to not envy those experiences, but to understand that all happens for a reason. And those who have them can often be so knocked off balance that it's seen as a negative experience. However, it does lead to a great awakening for those who don't then become uh, so disconnected from their human reality that they can't function. So this Kundalini rises naturally, slowly or quickly. I'm grateful for the gradual rise of it. And I would invite all of you to set the intention that through your efforts, through expanding your belief system and through affirmative prayer, that you awaken more and more to the true reality that we are without having this sudden increase that knocks you off balance. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Mary's question. I'm a student of the book, A Course in Miracles. Is Sanaya in agreement with the principles in that book? <laughs> yes, Sanaya is in agreement. They just give me a big lip twitch <laughs> with that one. And they're saying there is much truth there you can trust the source of that channeling which is Jesus and then they caution us to understand that when Jesus the consciousness of the vibration of the one known as Jesus speaks in that way it is coming through as a vibration of consciousness and not necessarily as the man who everyone knew as Jesus the goal of that work just as all works that try to get us to truth to awareness of our unity is to feel the vibration of the teachings to awaken truth within your heart and that's why once again there is so much similarity in these kinds of teaching great thank you thank you Okay, Sandy. Thank you all. Let me just interrupt you a second, Bev. I see more and more of you coming in, and I welcome you. Thank you so much for, for lending your energy to this event this evening. It's just a pleasure to be with all of you. And, and trust me, what I love about this work is, is that I just love every one of you and your energy and the love that you send to me is what makes all of this worthwhile, and to Bev as well. Wonderful. Okay, Sandy asks, how does a person get their logical mind and their heart mind in sync? I'm a left brain dominant person, I think. Uh, and she says, I trust you, Suzanne, because you are a left brain uh, person or your background. If one never has an aha experience, how do they get to trust or open their, your, their heart as you have? That's a great question, Sandy. What's really awesome is that you recognize your left brain aspect. Back when I was solely left brain, how many of you saw that picture of me in my, my uh, flaws uniform <laughs> earlier this week? It's so funny looking at that because I was totally left brain then. Didn't even know the difference between the logical analytical left brain and the flowing empathic intuitive right brain. Uh, as I said, recognizing that that is your tendency in this incarnation, simply set the intention to overcome that and seek balance. Now we talk about left brain and right brain, but it may prove much more helpful for all of you who want to be more balanced and thus more coherent in a coherent state. That means wholeness, not coherent as in you're incoherent. To instead of think left brain and right brain, think head versus heart. It's really the same thing. And this is the basis of my teaching now, especially after Wolf came through and Wolf's message and taught us about seeking and finding peace and tranquility by balancing the head with the heart. We mean by this, the head is the thinker. 
The heart is the knower. Think about, let's not use that word think, reflect upon times when you simply know things. Isn't that intuition coming to the forefront? Whereas those of us who rely so much on what we've been taught, what we've experienced in the outer world, tend to go directly to thinking, analyzing, judging, comparing. That's being in the head. That's a very masculine trait. We all have both within us. I've lately been writing shorthand when I take notes and remind myself to, to, to balance head and heart. I, I have, of course, the simple symbol of the heart with the Valentine's cards, and I needed a symbol for the head, and it was very clear to me to just draw a box to represent the head. And X are very linux is perfect for a symbol for that. The heart aspect is the curves, the flow, and so the heart drawing is a perfect symbol for that. When you're in your head, you're in a box. Perfect. We want to get out of the box of thinking a certain way, being rigid, and move into that expansive, open heart space. So how do we do that, Sandy asked. Number one, again, set the intention to balance the two. And then second, simply recognize what you have here is a pattern of behaving and thinking. It's a habit. And how do you break a habit? By repatterning your behaviors. So this is what I work on constantly, especially in these last few weeks and when I've had a new ramping up to a new level and really understand this whole balancing of the masculine and feminine aspects. And that feminine aspect is more in the heart and certainly working as a medium, I truly want to be more in that knowing state than the thinking state. You get in a flow state when you're creative, when you're playing music, when you're writing, doing art, when you're just lost in nature. That's a heart-based state. So set the intention of being present, being aware. What aspect of yourself are you identifying with? The thinker or the knower? We can do a little... Uh, exercise now and this is the kind of thing I'm really going to be doing at my unity village retreat in uh, in Missouri next April all of this new teaching so let's just do a quick exercise right now think about your awareness this is going to cut into our time but I hope it's valuable uh, your awareness is usually in your head because this is where all the input is coming in through your eyes, your ears, and your thinking is happening right there. But all it takes is an awareness that there is another mind in your body, and it's the heart mind. You can move your awareness, literally see your awareness like a ball of energy sinking down to the heart mind. And you realize that you can still sense what's going on around you from this mind that knows all that is connected with all that is. So just simply move your awareness to the heart mind and imagine knowing 360 degrees around you, not just straight out in front of you, seeing and being drawn to objects outside of yourself and thinking about them but moving your awareness to the heart area and tuning in with an intuitive, flowing discernment through knowing. That will lead you to so many greater insights from a right brain perception. That was a very long answer to Sandy's question, but again, it's habit. Just do that exercise that we did right there. That's one of many, many you can do and many that I'll be teaching at that four-day retreat to get out of the head and into the heart. It's very difficult to stay there, but the more you do that, that's where that balance comes into play. Wow. Great. Good stuff. Um, okay. Uh, Lilia asks, can you tell me your thoughts on euthanasia? I can tell you my thoughts, but let's go to more universal one. 
So Naya has talked about this in the past. And always when we get into questions of morality and ethics, once again, the advice is to go to the heart. What is the motive? Now, I don't know if that question is about pets or people, but the answer is the same. If the motive is to alleviate suffering, then at least there is understanding of why we would want to take the ending of a life into our own hands. So what I'm sensing is that there is no right or wrong answer because, again, this is the relative reality. But any decision that is made based on love comes from the highest possible motive. And that's about the good, best answer we're going to get on that one. Okay, thank you. Um, Carol says um, she is able to feel the energy of spirit very strongly. Uh, she even gets eye twitching, but she is unable to ascertain what the message is uh, that she's supposed to be receiving. How do you suggest that we can better hear, in quote, the messages that are being sent? How do we determine if it's real or just our imagination? <laughs> As Sanaya has often said, anything that comes through in consciousness is real. Anything. And there's a reason that those thoughts bubble up into your consciousness. And this is where the practice of resting in that open heart space will help you to discern more and more clearly what is your truth. My lip twitches as a way of letting me know that I am tapped into my team, that I am accessing information at a higher level than simply the human awareness. And it's going to come with practice and intention and asking for validation when you receive guidance. If you feel something is your imagination, know that that answer came from a higher place. It may be your own higher self, or it could be guides or loved ones on the other side. So even if you don't know the source, direct your heart directly to the source of that input and ask, if I am to trust what I just discerned, please give me a sign. I would like X, Y, Z as a sign. You can actually ask for what that sign is and then be open to that in the coming days popping into your life. If you don't see the sign, you very well may have imagined it. Keep repeating this process regularly and the signs will build up and then you discern what was the difference in my imagination. It has a bit of a heavier feeling to it versus the lightness of, a, of, a, of an ethereal message that comes from higher consciousness. It can be so subtle. If there's twitching without discerning any message at all, perhaps you're simply supposed to tune in and see if you feel a presence and then initiate a dialogue. All right, why did I just feel that? You've asked the question and now you wait. And if nothing happens, then feel gratitude for having received some kind of a sign. If it's just one twitch and it never happens again, that probably is just a tick in the body. But if it is repeated, then that is most likely a guide, a helper, trying to get your attention. Open that up for repeated contact, gratitude, and love connection every time you do so, and that could lead to a really beautiful relationship. Okay. Right. Uh, next question um, is from Donna. When you pray in your prayer language, are you praying with your guides or is your soul communicating with source? If Donna, if you're asking me directly, I don't uh, do supplicatory prayer any longer. Uh, supplicatory prayer is when you say, oh, please help me with this. 
to God, to a separate being. I don't do that at all anymore because my understanding of God has changed and evolved so much that I know that we all arise as thought forms of the one being, the source, this well of love, this infinite pure consciousness that we can't even put into words. So that would be like asking favors of a person. So I don't do that. However, I know that my guides are also aspects of source, just as I am. We are all, even the guides, acting out stories, but they are at a higher level of awareness and vibration than this Suzanne story at this level. So I do ask them to help me have more clarity, to guide me in the right direction. But that's about the extent of the prayer. Otherwise, it's affirmative prayer where I affirm that the greater good is being served by my actions, that, there, that I see the purpose in whatever challenges are being faced, that kind of prayer. All righty? Okay. okay. Uh, Dora has several questions. I'll ask this one first. Is it true that at this time of the year, the veil between our world and the next is thinner and we can communicate easier? <laughs> The veil waxes and wanes like the cycles of the moon. And as just as the, the moon and the tides have cycles, the calendar has cycles, our physical bodies have cycles, and so it will be different at, on different days at different times of the day for all of us. I am sensing that it has nothing to do with the Christmas season or any religious beliefs that the veil might be thinner at this time of the year, but that you can notice patterns in your own attunement to higher consciousness, that it comes and goes, and not, you're not to be discouraged when it seems to be not quite as accurate as it always is. The basic message is that we can get through the veil at any time because the veil is simply a construct of consciousness. The more we understand that we are pure consciousness, the veil literally disappears. So set that as your intention. Do not see the veil as an impediment or then it truly would be heavier at some, some times of the year than others. Do you see how our thoughts can be like erecting a wall just Look at your thoughts and state, I am pure consciousness, and therefore, even though we have cycles that cause my attunement to be greater or lesser, at any time, I can attune to that which I am. Wow. Bev, let's move on to somebody else's question, just so we get to ask as many different people's questions as possible. How are you all enjoying this? You can raise your hand if this is good stuff. or uh, This is kind of good because you can't raise your hand if you don't like it. <laughs> I see lots of thank yous coming in. Okay, excellent. Well, I hope you all enjoy it. It's uh, This is really fun for me. It's a good experience in focusing and trying not to just, what I'm trying not to do is saying Sanaya says. I want you to know that this is coming from us as a combined consciousness and therefore hopefully modeling to you that you can tap into that same source yourself. Not Sanaya, but higher consciousness in general. What did I just want to mention about, uh, oh, this q and I don't know how many of you know, but the first Thursday of every month on my radio show is strictly an hour of Q&As just like this. And that would be this Thursday, two days from now is the first Thursday of November. So if you can tune in, you can ask questions live on the air. And I always give away a free, one of my free online courses during that first show to somebody who calls in with a question. But meanwhile, here we are. Let's go with some more of it. Oh, I, I'm loving the, the feedback coming in uh, the chat right now. Lots of thank yous, lots of thumbs up. You um, Great. <laughs> this is interactive. So if you want to comment on an answer or one of the questions, uh, keep chatting with us. 
Oh. Is Bev great or what? Oh. <laughs> I could not do this work without her. Oh. And without Lynette, I don't know if Lynette's tuning in, but Lynette is my scheduling assistant and they, you both free me up to do uh, so many other things. So, okay. applause. <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll take a question that actually came in uh, by email earlier from yeah and I, I would just like to tell everybody that we were trying not to get questions by email so please when I do this again please do not submit questions by email because I really wanted to, this to be real-time live but because people did send them and we're taking a few of them just a few tonight and most of them came to me directly and Suzanne didn't see them ahead of time. So. Okay. okay. I understand, uh, Kristen says, I understand that on the other side, we are beings of light. Uh, we're surrounded by love. But on that side, it, is it also a sort of physical reality of its own? Are there physical structures? I've heard of classrooms and such. Are there lakes and mountains? Uh, can we create our reality around us? Does it feel physical when we do? Okay, that's enough, Bev. You have to keep these questions kind of short because I overload. I think I got the gist of it. Sorry to cut you off, but wow. Okay, I get the gist, and the gist is, what is it like on the other side? And I can tell you from experience doing readings that unanimously those spirits who show me what it's like on the other side show me a reality that they create with their own thoughts I'm being shown right now images of Robin Williams movie was it these dreams what's the movie that you remember Beth? I'm sorry somebody can type it on the, the Robin Williams movie where he crosses to the other side something what dreams may come I believe that's it what dreams may come and so vibrant colors but beautiful crystalline buildings and Think Wizard of Oz if you want, but beautiful surroundings. It sounds like utopia, and why wouldn't it be if we're creating from a place of love? So, yes, we create that. And how solid is it? Because it is also a relative reality, meaning that it's not just pure consciousness. There are objects to draw our attention to, meaning there's then a subject and object, and it's all relative to each other, that it appears very solid to those who are in it. Quite interesting though, then, our reality to those in spirit is not solid, as Carly Hughes, Irene Vuvalita's daughter, showed me when I asked her how she could see a dog treat under the couch that was indeed under the couch. She showed it to me one evening when she dropped in at her house and she said it's because they can see right through our solid objects and some of you have had the miraculous experience of seeing loved ones literally walk right through a wall or a door. And so each reality is relative to each other but within that reality things are appear to be solid. But is this hand solid? Not if we were to put it under an electron microscope. Everything is simply vibrating. Interesting stuff. All righty. Ready. Okay, from Lynette. Do you have any thoughts about if there is a particular purpose in a soul coming here as a transgender individual? Was it a decision made by the soul before coming to Earth? Uh, is um, that's enough. That's two questions. <laughs> Sorry, Beth. I can only hold so much. Okay. I am definitely sensing that that is a soul's plan and that you're seeing more and more of that now. Why now? Because the consciousness of humanity is at a point where we are even able to consider it. So while it's not openly accepted at all levels of humanity, you didn't see this a couple hundred years ago. Uh, I'm actually sensing that that desire was not in human consciousness at that time, that people are now coming in with a desire to experiment with different viewpoints from the gender aspect. And therefore we're seeing more of, more of it and it is presenting us perfect opportunities to practice understanding and compassion and change. Is there a follow on to that? Uh, no, it was, it, if it was planned and does it serve a purpose? There we go. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, huh. 
Okay, a reincarnation question, anonymous. Um, with everything happening now, simultaneously, are aspects of our higher self experiencing reincarnation simultaneously? Are, well, all aspects of our self are here. Okay, so let's talk about time. In this reality, time unfolds in a linear fashion. So we can look at the past and say, I had a past life as a knight in shining armor. And this is hypothetical. <laughs> and I may have a come back and reincarnate as another person in a farm in Nebraska. And if everything's happening simultaneously, how, why does that happen? And here's the key word that will answer so many questions that we have in this lifetime. Viewpoint. From the viewpoint within the stories that we're playing out, it's linear and there's a before, a present, and an after. From the viewpoint of pure being, all this entire reality simply bubbles up and it's all played out. Think about a dream you might have had last night. How long did that dream take? You might have traveled from here and traveled around the world in a jet and in the dream it took, you know, how long did that take? It's instantaneous. There's no sense of time. That entire dream, you can encapsulate it and it just happened. So from outside of this reality, everything happens now. From within it, we have these linear unfolding lifetimes and Sanaya is laughing because finally they're starting to explain how we can have simultaneous lifetimes they don't want to get too far into that because they do say it kind of uh, blows our circuits <laughs> when they talk about these things okay right. great uh, Susan asks I'm trying to clarify, when does a soul enter an unborn baby? I've read that the soul is there at conception. I've also read that the soul comes in just before birth. The second that question was asked, it's just this, this knowing, this sense I heard at the time of conception. That is when a new life form begins. Let me get this answer here a little bit more deeply. <laughs> so the answer is coming up that when does the story begin? It's all one source. There is no separate being. And yet we need to pin this down. We need to know when the story begins. The story begins when the life begins, and that's the point of conception. Even at that point, the viewpoint of the parents is there's a new life inside the mother, and that's the story, when really there's no differentiation between the mother, the father, and the baby. It's all source acting out stories. So what is it you're trying to understand and why? The greatest understanding that we can come to is it really is just one being, there's no differentiation. And when there's no differentiation, all you have is love. I kind of got a little bit off topic there, but it is an interesting question. That why does it matter? Hmm. It could matter if people are asking about miscarriages or abortion. There is a soul assigned to every new being to play out that story. And if for some reason that life story is interrupted, I've seen over and over again how that soul energy surrounds the mother and father for their whole life, no matter what happened during that pregnancy, with no judgment, with only love, because they're connected. Because that story is supposed to play out as one family group. So know that no matter what happens, the love is always there and will follow you. Okay. Excellent. Um, an add on to that from Susan is, does an unborn child know that we're praying for him or her? 
<laughs> well, I think the answer was inherent in, in that last one. The prayers are, are love sent out from the heart, mind. And that energy is felt at all levels through knowing and never ends. So, of course, the answer is yes. Um, I go to um, a question from Sharon. When suicide is mentioned as the reason for a person's death, many people comment things like he was mentally ill. I, I think so sadness um, overwhelms humans and suicide is simply a way to end it. What have you learned from those who have taken their own life? Okay, since that question is directly to the Suzanne story here, I'll tell you from my point of view, from my personal experience, that, oh boy, I have brought through hundreds of souls whose people story ended their lives themselves. And every single one says, I'm still here, I'm doing fine. Every single one was aware, is aware of the pain that their actions caused their family members and does feel regret for that. I'm not sure I can say a blanket statement. Every single one speaks about missed opportunities here in earth school, but most do. And many then dedicate their ongoing awareness to helping the family here or to impressing upon the consciousness of others still here who are going through struggles to stay with their human life, their human story, to work through the challenges, to not end up on the other side before they learned those lessons and helped other people here. That's what I've learned. Okay, thank you. Uh, a question that can you um, do you guys know how much I love all of you I'm just overflowing. <laughs> <laughs> I was sitting in here earlier getting ready and I was just listening to this music and it was just bubbling up and I let out this this whoo this whoo and I'm surprised that Ty didn't come running from the other side of the house but I think he's used to me by now you you wouldn't want to go running with me it's almost embarrassing but he's so used to me because I just get high on life and and I make funny motions. I was, <laughs> was in Salt Lake City with Bev last weekend at a conference and I went for a walk and I was just so overflowing with love and I had this music on and I'm, and I'm making little motions and I thought they're gonna come and lock me up. I know they are, I wanna go home. <laughs> I mean, home back to Ty, I didn't wanna be locked up in a straight jacket. <laughs> but, you know, sometimes that's just what happens. Okay, I had to lighten things up a little because yeah. I have to, I'm trying very hard to be in this beautiful heart space to get the answers today. So if you can feel the energy, do are you noticing the difference between, I'm just not in the head today. I'm not thinking. I'm really trying to apply what the guides have taught me. No thinking, no judging, no asking before I even talk, is this right or wrong? Just trusting the knowing. I hope you guys will try that because it's really an awesome way of being. Okay, Beth. Okay, Anonymous. Uh, what is the importance of family history, if any? Do generations preceding us have an interest in our lives now? Yes, because all stories are connected whether the physical life has ended or not. And because at a soul level, we know that what plays out here in earth school has an effect on the whole, there is an interest in continuing to guide us in watching what happens. And um, you know, it's that old picture of the soul sitting in heaven, which is really just right here, a different state of awareness, eating the popcorn and saying, Oh, look what they're doing there. Oh, are they really going to do that? Oh, no, watch. Ow! <laughs> you know, here we go again. So, yes, there is an interest. There is influence from those who are part of our soul family across the veil, which is right here. And the we have chosen that family because of the 
characteristics and traits and the genetic passed down, I'm missing the word in there, what is passed down genetically from generation to generation. There are lessons inherent in physical challenges, in traits, personality, the history that leads to a certain belief system. So absolutely, we choose our families and, and we are connected and remain connected even across generations. Great, okay. Um, Cindy asked, how do we reconcile the dedication to spirit with the reality of what's going on today uh, where hate and oppression are rising to such levels? How do we reconcile the dedication to spirit with what's going on today? Well, I celebrate that more and more of us are awakening to the fact that the hate and the discord arises from the story. And that all of us who recognize these are stories we're playing are alchemists. We are able to transmute the anger, the fear, the discord into love. And you can only do that when you see that anger and fear and discord for what it is. People stuck in the story who don't realize who they are. I want to share with you an analogy that might help you understand more of who we are. Imagine that you are in a fog bank and you're stumbling around a bit and you don't realize you're in a fog bank because this is all you know and it gets a little bumpy and a little uncomfortable and suddenly you step out of the fog bank and all is clear and you look around and you look back at the fog bank and you say oh my gosh no wonder i didn't understand what i was doing no wonder i stumbled around a bit and got out of sorts because i couldn't see but now i see and I'm going to go back in there knowingly and help my fellow travelers who are still stuck in that fog, but I'm going to see things differently. I'm going to see with the heart. And so we step back into the fog bank and we don't lose sight this time of who we are. And so as we see some people stumbling about and shouting at each other because they're stepping on each other and they're arguing with each other, we remember that clarity exists and we've brought it back in with us. So how do I reconcile it? I see the story for what it is and I hope you all will see that none of us is better or worse. We're all still living stories, but you can see the story from that different viewpoint. I don't wanna put viewpoints in quotes. That's the word of the day, viewpoint, you choose it. And when you see people arguing with each other and when there's angst, they're coming from the viewpoint within the story, identified with the story instead of knowing we all arise from that clear awareness. That makes all the difference in the world. Okay. Um, Sister Rose Marie um, asks a question about interdimensional beings. Uh, what does Sanaya say about these beings and other forms of life in the cosmos? Think disco ball again. It's all source and our source, us, we as the source are limitless. Why wouldn't we want to play as other beings in multitudes of realities, different shapes and forms, just playing and interacting. But there is a bit of compartmentalization so that we have earth school here and we might have another reality over here with a different name but this is why we can play in other dimensions right now simply by shifting our focus and getting into an expanded state of consciousness because we are that consciousness from which all of these stories arise whether they're extraterrestrials or human stories that is our unified source our common heritage so we are viewing this reality through the lens of a body and a mind but we're not stuck there 
but there is a reason we're looking through this particular lens at this time. So that source, us, we can shine in this human realm. That's why we're here. So do your best at shining in this role. If you want to play and want to learn more about other realities, then go have some adventures in consciousness. But in the meantime, there's a reason that we as awareness have chosen this reality. Let's just shine and do our best to help others shine with us. Thank you. Okay, Rhonda has a question about spirit guides. Can our major spirit guide work with more than one person at a time? Can they? Absolutely. And they have told us repeatedly, we give them enough challenge. Why would they want more than one? <laughs> when we're sleeping, they're taking a break. Trust me. <laughs> Planning how to get through the next day with us. They can, but generally just one person per spirit guide at the level of the spirit guide. Now, when you get to the masters, very much more powerful a greater reach they can help many of us at once but individual spirit guides take on one person from physical birth to physical death i'm so excited to tell you that my new hemisync set working with your spirit guides comes out in two days this thursday november 1st if you're on my email list you'll get an announcement about it but uh it's it's a very nice product and um, I'm, I am really proud of this and the people at Hemisync are super excited because they uh, they can feel the higher energy that created that. So I, uh, I hope that you will enjoy it as well. Bev, you had a chance to try it and uh, mm -hmm. Lynette did, they're my sounding boards and uh, it's gonna be really cool with those Hemisync tones overlaid on it. If you haven't met your guides yet, this is really going to be a good opportunity to get to know your team. Right. You just answered someone's question who had asked, are you doing a new hemi-sync? <laughs> Yay. So this one has uh, three different tracks and uh, every one of them dictated by Sanaya. And I, I really am just so grateful to, to be able to share this with everybody. The, you know, me, the naval officer that didn't even used to believe in spirit guides, but clearly our guides want us to know that they're helping us and want us to get a personal relationship with them. And this is just a super tool to help us to do that. And for uh, Ginger asked, how do we learn who our guides are and how to connect with our guides? And truly, I don't want to sound like a commercial, but it's all, that's what this series is all about. And also my workshop with Suzanne Wilson, I've given it three times around the country. We're taking it to Washington, D.C. in July. We just started taking registrations for that yesterday. So a two-day in-person workshop in at, right near Dulles Airport. Information is on my um uh, calendar of events for that one yes okay um uh, bev let me just say um that subject clearly takes up a two full day workshop and the three cd set so i that's why i'm, I'm not answering it just succinctly it it can't be answered that succinctly okay, okay. um Paola asks, um, if we ever develop technology that allows anyone to communicate with our loved ones in the afterlife, such as the soul phone, would that be detrimental to our spiritual development uh, because it would make it less difficult to learn our lessons here on earth? Wow, I hear ding, 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 ding. Paola, you asked the million dollar question and I have given so much thought to this as uh, Dr. Gary Schwartz and his dedicated team are working on the soul phone. And the assurance I get is that just as when we're supposed to learn our lessons here, certain guidance from our higher consciousness is withheld, I truly believe that certain communication across the veil will not happen through technology if it will impede our progress. This is a great intelligence 
from which we arise. We are that intelligence. It's our path to understand that and to get back to tapping into this intelligence ourselves. I've been given a tremendous lesson lately in why I'm not sensing my own mother who passed two months ago. It's because I had some really awesome learning to do. And the result is this new and increased connection I have with my team, a greater understanding about who we are and why we're here. And if I had remained clinging to the little Susie and her mom's story, I don't know that I would have had that learning. That's a little tough to swallow, but I know that my mom is here. I talk to her anyway, and I'm focusing on the greater picture now. So it's kind of something for all of us to think about. How much do we truly need the other members of our story? We love them. That love never dies, and therefore the love is always here. But they and we arise from the same source. That's what they want us to know. When we can step out of the fog and join them in the clarity of the unity of who we all are, that's when the miracles really happen. So do we need technology for that to happen? That's the big question. We don't, at this human level, control that. So it's really going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Oh. Great. Um, this uh, sort of leads into a next question um, that the person asked to be anonymous. Um, is it possible that some souls come to earth in human form with a soul con contract where no matter how much they meditate or sit in the power, they will never be able to connect with spirit? Wow, what a great question. <laughs> and the answer is, yes, of course, anything is possible because you're dealing with limitless possibility, unlimited creation. And so why wouldn't we have a few souls who are just like physical blindness, blinded for life? And what lessons will that lead to, if not for the one who's blind, but for those around them? And uh, just like a wild card? in a deck for a poker game, we don't always know who that will be. So here's this one who didn't even know there was a greater reality until around age 46, and then there, th there it is. Maybe somebody will have a great awakening on their deathbed. Because we don't know, the heart keeps urging us to keep searching and in seeking these bells and whistles experiences, we can't help but learn. We can't help but turn up the love. And the discouragement comes when we're stuck in the story. If you're discouraged, then you're still identifying with the story. So then you ask, what is beyond the story? What is underneath the story? What is behind the story? Step out back from the fog bank where the story is and you may have some pretty big ahas and no longer need huge connections with your loved ones because you simply get it huge connections with your guides bells and whistles spiritual awakenings awakening doesn't have to be some huge event like a kundalini rising it can just be this moment of grace when you say Oh my goodness, I've been that all along. It's right here. I can't be separated from pure awareness, for I am that. And do we have to awaken to that? It's just so close. It's as close as your breath. Excellent. Um, sort of in the same vein, uh, Pamela says she's watched uh, last month's seminar multiple times and said, I, I understand the disco ball analogy with the source experiencing life through different lenses. But also, you said, there's the Suzanne story. And Sanaya said, 
the story continues after death because there are more lessons to be learned. I'm, I'm confused. Uh, what am I missing here? Okay. It's just like our dear friend Brenda Baker who came back immediately after passing. She said to us, I don't have to appear as the Brenda story, but I'm doing that so you recognize me. And at times when she's been teaching me, she morphs and blends and becomes just like the voice of Sanaya because all of us are shape-shifting at all times. Can you wrap your head around that? So why don't I see my mom? Because I don't need to see her because it serves the greater good that I not see her right now. As if that is frightening to you to not see your loved ones and you need it so badly, then you're identifying with the story and there's nothing wrong with that. These are stages of your soul's evolution, okay? So once we cross the veil, does the Suzanne story need to continue? I'm hoping <laughs> that when I cross the veil, I'm gonna look at Sanai and all these members and say, yeah, I thought so, I know who you are. And we'll all just blend into one big mass of love. But I may, oh my God, what if I pass before time? Would it not serve the greater good for me to appear to him in the bedroom or in the kitchen? A man who is pretty sure there's an afterlife deeply, deeply grieving me and suddenly there's the Suzanne story. Wouldn't that propel him now having had that firsthand experience that we all long for so badly? Wouldn't source bubble up as the Suzanne story to serve that purpose? I may not need to continue on on the other side, or maybe I do. I have no idea how advanced we can go on the other side. I just know that we can dissolve into pure being here and now for brief moments enough to taste and experience who we really are so that we don't remain deluded by the story the whole time. I hope that makes more sense. Luckily, you'll get the video in a couple of days and you can go listen to that one over and over too because it is kind of hard to wrap our heads around from time to time. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, um, hang on, Beth. I just suppose, I just want to say, just imagine this beautiful sea of love and you and I and everybody you know and everybody that exists bubbles up like a wave, a wave, and then it dissolves back down into the sea of love and it comes up again as, as it serves a purpose or because it's fun or because it's just love and that's what it does. It just expresses itself as you and me. And does there have to be a purpose? Why do we create beautiful music? We can't help but do that. So we just keep bubbling up and making more and more beautiful, more beautiful music. And that's life. Okay. Deep stuff. Beautiful. Okay. Um, Sherry asks, I worry about losing the attachment to my child who has passed and was adopted. Are connections different if not biological? Not at all. And, and please, I'm not saying that your loved ones don't exist once they cross the veil. I'm just saying that you and I are bubbling up from moment to moment here and now. There is only now from the viewpoint outside the story. So this is, this is a lucid dream of the source, what we're experiencing here. So I'm not saying your loved ones don't exist. I'm saying we're all part of this one big, beautiful drama, this beautiful movie that has drawn us in because we're all in it together, one big web. And our loved ones who have passed are still part of that. And they're, we're all players in this drama who come in and out as the drama unfolds. So they haven't gone anywhere any more than you do from moment to moment as we bubble up. But just notice that any fear, any discomfort 
holds a lesson in it and you get to ask of your guides, what's the lesson for me? What do I need to understand about all of this? So biological versus adopted, it's the heart connection. We're all coming from the same place. An adopted child was meant to be with those parents, just got there by a bit of a more roundabout way. The connection is a heart connection. That's all that matters. Okay, an angel, excuse me, a question about angels. Are angels souls with a particularly high vibration? Um, are souls chosen to become angels? Wow. This was anonymous. Yeah. Okay. Angel is a term that we put onto a high vibration aspect of consciousness, a thought form in my recent terminology, a story that bubbles up as an angel. And we have a whole reality populated by angels, such as the archangels. Did they choose that? We all arise from the same source. We are all of the same source bubbling up. So it's source that bubbles up as these angels. Is that a choice? In human terms, from the human viewpoint, yes. From pure being, this is being expressing itself in higher forms and less vibratory forms in human form. They're helpers that serve that purpose for us. Okay? Okay. Um, sort of a, a question here on a, on a current event from Gail. What is the purpose, or is there a purpose, of a, quote, madman killing Jewish people praying in the synagogue? How does this act of terror in any way benefit mankind? Oh, the benefits, the opportunities are huge. But the purpose, this is, once again, as, the, as most guides will advise any of us, is free will gone awry. This is somebody so lost in the fog of the story that they have lost complete connection with the heart, our connection with our source. So you have someone who is so lost in this false sense of separation that they have lost touch with what is truly real. So it's not a purpose. It's not planned. It is evidence of a false sense of separation. I'm going to put this very succinctly. This is going to be part of the teaching for the November webinar. If you want to sign up for that, we're going to go into this more deeply, but you want a definition of love. This one's straight from Sanaya just in the last couple of days. Love is absence of separation. Think about that. So most people that do crazy things are feeling very cut off from the world, from other people, from their own heart. That's a sense of separation. When if you step out of the story, everything arises from pure being, a state of no separation. That's why we say, if you call that pure awareness, pure being God, that's why God is love because there is no separation. There is only awareness, this, pure existence, I am. And every one of us shares that. So when you see terrorism, you're dealing with people who are so deluded as to who they are that they see nothing but separation, me versus them. They're feeling pain, which is truly separation. So it's not a purpose, it's a result of a false sense of separation. What happens as a result of that is people seek answers. When we seek retaliation, when we have judgment, that's from within the story, within the fog bank. Those who have stepped back into the fog, having experienced the clarity, knowing I am that, from which all arises. Know that ultimately outside this drama, there is only pure love. We dissolve back into that ultimately. All of this is temporary. All of the pain is within the temporary 
story that's playing out. But this peace that passes all understanding comes from having touched through the heart that place where nothing changes, where no thing exists. So what comes from these stories is being able to read the headlines and when you can do that and still know that all is well, that goodness is the basis of life itself, then there is hope for humanity as more and more of us come to that understanding, step back into the fog and shine the light so that the fog clears. I think we have a way to go, but the fog is clearing. And just the fact that you're here listening tonight, that heart pull, that connection that we all share, that's evidence of that. So what we do is we become the light, we shine our light, we help others to see there is another viewpoint. That's what we say when we say we make the highest choices. We go to the highest viewpoint, and that is always going to be beyond, beneath the story, the place, the space, the awareness from which the story bubbles up. Okay. Another anonymous question. Uh, can Sanaya speak to the environmental concerns many in the world, or to many in the world currently have? There are many who fear the world is going to be uninhabitable in a short time. Okay. Again, it's viewpoint, isn't it? This world is part of this drama that we've all chosen as awareness to take part in. Can you step back enough to be the change that's going to take to change our world. That's what's required of us. The peace comes from knowing that ultimately there is no death. There is a consciousness even within Mother Earth that is looking out for herself, but <laughs> here's, here's the thing. By saying that this is part of a drama, it's just a story, we don't say then that it doesn't matter, that we can just harm our earth. We can then make choices that come from a higher place saying, I'm aware that this is all temporary, that this is, as A Course in Miracles would say, like a dream from which we're going to awaken, but we're in this dream. And since we're here, we're going to make decisions and take actions that make a difference, that show people that mistreating our earth, nature is not acceptable. So you can still come from a place of love, come from a place of awareness, awakened awareness, and still be concerned without being distraught. I hope that makes sense. Thank you. Um, you know, this is this is challenging to hold that 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 I'm going to admit it. <laughs> it's challenging <laughs> to hold that focus from the heart without getting in the head. It's kind of like doing an actual channeling session, which I usually only hold for about a half an hour to forty five minutes. So I may not go the full two hours tonight. Maybe another fifteen minutes, and wow. you probably all are going to. <laughs> fall over yourself <laughs> but let's see how are you doing Beth oh great great okay all right I'm I'm buoyed by all these chat comments that are wonderful and people are so thankful for this um let's see uh, Jenny asks what happens to the personality when someone dies how oh. A medium connect to that personality. Well, that's the thing. When I do a reading, if I don't feel the personality, then I really haven't connected with that person. And our personality is, these are the characteristics and the traits that identify the role that we are playing in this lifetime. Remember, we are pure awareness bubbling up as a body-mind, and that comes with certain 
traits, characteristics, steady patterns and programming. That's our personality. That's the ego. So if you wish to remain connected with your soul family from across the veil, just like Brenda, you are going to maintain that thought form. Awareness maintains it and comes back and participates in a reading as that which would be recognized by the family members here. So yes, personality remains, but because it's still part of the world of duality, it is changing as well. So this is why we see personalities advance souls grow even across the veil some just like here on physical earth faster than others as we all grow to be more and more beautiful expressions of the light that we are okay uh deanna asks why do you suppose souls choose violent exits as opposed to a gentle transition The soul cannot be hurt by a physical reality. Pain is not felt upon death by the soul. Mm -hmm. If lessons can be learned by a certain type of accident, then that may be a choice. Sometimes certain passings happen as the result of free will gone awry, such as those who were mm -hmm. uh, killed in the synagogue terrorist mm -hmm. act that we just uh, heard about earlier, but simply a reminder that ultimately beyond the story, there is no suffering. And if we're suffering, then we're still stuck in the story. Remember, you get to choose the viewpoint. It's that flexibility and it's a habit to remain stuck in the story. If it's too painful to see what's going on around you, tune into the heart, shift your awareness there and say, if I am this awareness, I would like an example of no suffering, of the peace that's always within here. Let me see this in a different way. That's an example of the prayer to your guides, to higher consciousness that we talked about earlier, the prayer. I think I'm going to take one or two more, Bev. I'm having trouble holding this focus, and I don't want to give any answers that aren't the highest answers. So let's just uh, yeah, get one or two more. Barbara asked, are, are any humans ever born without souls? So rather than just a yes or no question, let's examine that. Who are we? We are pure awareness that bubbled up as a thought and then the thought became focused on the thought and runs off and becomes a story, acting out a story in this human form. That human form can become aware of itself as the source or keep focusing outward. We all arise from this pure consciousness mm -hmm. and individuated aspects of that consciousness, mm -hmm. we might call that a soul. The soul is the one that appears to take on a body mind. So the answer is, could you have the appearance of a story without the thought form beneath it? If that's the soul, then what is the answer? one precedes the other okay wow this is heavy duty deep stuff i think we're going to end there it just keeps getting more and more deep and i want to absolutely ensure that the answers come from the highest place and i don't want to just start blabbering now <laughs> so uh why don't we do this again sometime I love that so many of you joined us. What do you think, Bev? Sound like a good idea? That's good. We'll do it again. Yeah, we'll do that sometime. Not within a month. We need a break. And I, poor Ty gave up another evening with me to do this, but uh, he's such a champ. I love you all. I thank you for joining me. Let's see if I've just said everything that I needed to say. Yeah, I sure did. Uh, 
And just a reminder that Thursday is another chance to ask questions that didn't get answered today. Yes, um, indeed. So my thanks to Bev, and let's all just join our hearts again. I don't want to just leave you like, ah, what just hit me? So let's just move our awareness into our heart. Take a nice deep breath. Breathe in the love that we've been surrounding with. Send that love out to each of us. I just think it's awesome how we all came together using technology for this purpose. So I'm glad it worked. Why don't we just stamp our feet just a little bit to ground ourselves because truly we kind of all get into that same space. And with gratitude to all of you and to Spirit for helping us, I want to wish you all a blessed good night. And thank you. Thanks, Beth.